psalmist. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. A couple of things real briefly. One is continue to pray for Robin. Uh, she is in dialysis this morning, uh, but she also has some kind of infection that they're dealing with. She's feeling a lot better today. Appreciate your prayers for her. Also, Rivka and Lincoln. Lincoln. I was getting there. Uh, are traveling. They're in Arizona or California or somewhere on the other side of the Mississippi that doesn't really matter. And uh, just pray for them that they return home quickly and soon. Amen. And also, um, pray for all of the things going on in our congregation. We have so many different things going on now. And look, I know sometimes people get upset or, or feeling of uh, like they're not accomplishing what they should if they're not at everything that goes on in the congregation. We don't expect anybody to be at everything that goes on at the congregation. But we do want everybody to be involved in as much as they can be involved in the congregation. So we have a lot of new things going on for the ladies. Uh, we're working on doing some stuff for the men. I'm hoping that we're going to do a fishing trip soon. Yay. Okay, Stan, good. And, uh, and some other things for the, for the men uh, coming up. And uh, so I'm excited about all that. We had a movie night last night. And uh, I think it was Loving Leia. Yeah. So uh, pretty good movie. So anyhow, lots of things going on. But the most important thing we do here is worship and study the Word of God. Everything yes. else is yeah. just being a family. And uh, we just try to be a really big family. And if you want to have a really big family, this is a really great place to do that. But I want you to understand that just like families get in the way, get nosy, annoying, all that stuff, we are really good at all that stuff. So just understand we're just a family of regular people who have problems and faults and difficulties and have good days and bad days and all of that. Uh, but uh, if you're looking for people that really love one another and love the Lord, this is a really great place to find them. Amen? This week's parasha begins with, and I feel so awkward, I'm using a real paper Bible this morning. My iPad is not here, so if I try to get the page to turn, you know, or, or try to, you know, cut and paste or something, just ignore that this morning. Um, Anyhow, we are in Deuteronomy chapter 21. I want to read this one. I would read that one, but the print's really small. I just realized how old I am. Sorry. I'll read from this one. Hmm? Yeah, by the way, it's Ron's birthday today. Yay, birthday. So, Deuteronomy 21.10, when you go out to war against your enemies and honor not your God hands them over to you and you take them captive, suppose you see among the captives a beautiful woman and you desire her and would take her as your wife. Now, this is one of those parashahs that is, is not necessarily pleasing to the ears of modern Americans uh, because we don't think in the terms of, we try to apply 21st century cultural sensibilities to biblical uh, precepts, and that doesn't work because we've gone so far away from God's ways that it just doesn't seem acceptable. But I want you to understand, first of all, that this was God's way of taking care of these women. This was not God's forcing people to get married. Matter of fact, look, I just want you to think about a woman crying nonstop for 30 days. And then think, would you want to marry her? This is, this is God's way of preserving. You have to remember that by the time this happens, all the men of the city, the village, the town have been killed. So you have a bunch of women that are standing there by themselves that have no means of support, no means to take care of anything. Their cities have been destroyed. All that's done, and the Lord is taking care of them and making sure that they're providing.
provided for. This is one mechanism of that provision. When you read through the rest of the Torah, there's other mechanisms for that provision, like the gleaning of the corners and taking care of the poor and meeting the so This wasn't the only way that a woman would be taken care of, but it was a way that the Lord said, if you fight a war, you defeat your enemy, and there's a woman there, and you go, hey, you know, I kind of like her. Um, then there's a mechanism for uh, pro, pro, pro keeping her purity and allowing for real thought, prayer, deliberation, and all to take place before you marry <coughs> her so that you weren't stuck with her and she wasn't stuck with you. And if after the 30 days was up, you changed your mind, I can tell you that if I was in a house with a woman crying for 30 days, um, if it wasn't really love, changing my mind would be an option. <laughs> and so, so it wasn't a forced situation. It was a way to preserve the purity of the woman and take care of her during this time of transition and all of that and provide a means for uh, fairness for both the man and her as this goes on. But I don't want to talk about all that this morning. I'd just like to, to make that clear because this passage seems to offend a lot of modern minds because we don't think in those terms. But this was God showing righteousness as opposed to the way that the uh, pagans did, where they would just take the woman, rape her, and if they didn't like her, they'd just throw her to the side or kill her or sell her into slavery or whatever. God said, we're not doing that stuff. My people are holy people. They're different. They're going to live righteously. And, and women have honor and respect in God's kingdom. Uh, and should always have honor and respect in God's kingdom. But I want to talk about this very first line. And then I want to jump to the Brit Kadashah reading for this morning uh, that Linda read. And I love watching Linda read because like, when you're supposed to do your part, she is not going on until you join in. She is just going to stand there and look and She's going to wait until you say right along with her those prayers. And I kind of like that about Linda. She is, Linda's a unique gift. Amen, Rick? Good. <laughs> so the, the passage begins with when you go out to war against your enemies. And Adonai, your God, hands them over to you. And you take them captive. I love this Parsha. Next Parsha begins with a very similar sentence. I love God's promise of victory in these passages. This is, it starts with when this happens, not if this happens. I love that God gave us as his children a promise of victory. Wow, there's like three people in here that are glad that God promised victory. Amen. The rest of you had a tough week. Evidently, I was out of town and the world fell apart. And now you're just not sure God promised victory. But let me assure you, God has promised victory to his people. Amen. And all of the Torah that we read from when they get to the land in is all based upon that victory. We get sidetracked with all kinds of things, but we forget this. So let me read this from the Brit Kedeshah. It says this. Um, Yeshua said to them, isn't this the reason that you've gone astray? Because you don't understand the scriptures or the power of God. We tend to forget certain things, especially as Messianics. We, we can be the world's worst at um, getting things backwards. Uh, and forgetting that God has to do his job before people change before we can have expectations of change, before we can have any of those things. That you have to become a new creature before you can start acting like a new creature. Honestly, acting like a new creature. Not just pretending, because there's a lot of folks that pretend uh, that, they're, that they change, especially uh, young people, and I'm picking at young people, but especially young people of marrying age. Uh, they, they become exceptionally good at pretending they're something until they get married. Uh, older people do that also, uh, but, but I can only talk about myself, and I, I've never been single old. So, but I remember single young, and men especially, and 
and I can't speak for women, I'll have to let my wife talk about women, but men especially are, are chameleons, uh, especially when women are involved. And we can become and morph into, we're like shapeshifters. What? And we become whatever it is we think that woman desires up until we become what she desires. And uh, believers uh, or people in a body like this can sometimes try to do the same thing. Because people that come to a synagogue or even a church come partially because of a recognition of brokenness. That they recognize they have a need that needs to be filled. And they understand that things aren't right the way they are, and so they're looking for an answer to that problem. And one of the places they search is a congregation like ours. They're looking for a solution to their problem, whatever their brokenness is, whatever the sin in their life is, uh, whatever. Uh, and, and in some cases, it's not even sin in their life. Uh, it's loss. Sometimes a significant loss happens and it brings people to a place where they're searching for an answer or a reason in their life. And they feel broken, so they come. And then they find a group of people like us that are just a loving, kind group of people that just go out of our way to try to make people uh, be, be welcome and all of that. And then they, they think, well, what do, how do I have to act in order to be able to stay here and have these people like me? What do I have to do? So they, they try to, on their own power and by their own abilities, adapt themselves to the Torah. They try to, by their own flesh will, um, do that. Now, I can tell you as someone that over the last um, year uh, or, or so uh, has been trying to lose weight. I, I've lost weight and, and then I got sick and I gained a little back and I'm trying to lose again. Um, but I tried for years to lose weight uh, on my own power. And I would, you know, make all kinds of commitments and I'd buy all kinds of diet products and I bought all kinds of exercise equipment to hang my clothes on. <laughs> and uh, all kinds of things that I did. But on my own, I didn't have the willpower to always push the plate away. And so I end up trying to do something on my own that I didn't give to the Lord fully so that he could help me to do it. And I know the same thing happens with people with problems with alcoholism or pornography or greed or envy or jealousy or any of the things that we deal with, lying and deception and, and all those things. Is people want to do right, but on their own strength, they don't have the ability to do right. And it's very frustrating to, to make that and start out and fail. And then you start out and you fail. And not only is it frustrating to you, but it becomes frustrating to everybody around you. Because they'll start using the word hypocrite. And I've said before, People complain that congregations, churches, synagogues are filled with hypocrites, but the truth is it's the only place they can be. Because if they weren't here, they wouldn't be hypocrites. But too often we apply the word hypocrite to people who have honest hearts but are simply trying to accomplish God's purpose by their own strength. And there are people that are sincerely trying to do the right thing. They're sincerely trying to win the battle that they're fighting, no matter what that battle is. Whether it's uh, depression or frustrations that come from broken marriages, broken families, all those things. Whether it's your children uh, and your husband or your wife or whatever we're trying to be good people to. And we make the promise, we make the commitment, we say, I'm going to do better, I'm going to try harder, I'm going to. But all of those things become irrelevant the minute our flesh becomes more powerful 
than what God's trying to do in us. Because we're trying to do it on our own. And we fail over and over. Does anybody relate to any of this? Yes. And so we struggle with these things. And it's not. And, and then we look around and we see somebody that, that fell. And we, we judge them as a hypocrite. Or a fake or a phony. When the truth is they're just a human. Trying to do the supernatural with their human strength. And it's just not it just can't happen. And so all this stuff that Yeshua was talking about with the Sadducees that we read earlier where they said a man had, you know, marries his wife and he dies and then his wife marries his brother and then he dies and his wife marries his other brother and he dies and his wife marries his other brother and, and, and goes on through seven of them and he says, whose wife is she in the world to come? And his response is, you don't understand the scripture. And you don't understand the power of God. And he wasn't saying they didn't understand what the scripture said. Because the scripture does say what they said. And their question is, in the world to come, and the scripture teaches about a world to come, though they didn't believe in it. They were quoting the scripture accurately, but they didn't understand the power of God. They didn't understand that God, when he... Uh, when we transition from this world to the next world, we transition from a mortal to an immortal, and things change, and we become as supernatural beings. With we don't have the same issues and problems. We're not going to be having uh, children and wives and all that stuff. There, I mean, it, it just could you, it just different. And he says, but you don't understand the power of God. And I think that's the most important part of the statement. Is this whole group of people were Sadducees that were trying to live for God, but they didn't understand the power of His Spirit, of the Ruach. And so they struggled all the time. They didn't believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in heaven and hell. They didn't believe in miracles, signs, and They didn't believe in any of that stuff. Could you imagine how miserable you would be if you only had the power that you had? Rav Shaul says, if I only had hope in this world, I would be of all men most miserable. And we live that way because we don't understand the power of God and His deliverance. And that He makes us new creatures. And that through Him giving us the victory, we then can do the other thing. Now the rest of this week's parasha and going into the next week's parasha is a long list of things and commandments that God gave for us to observe. I love next week's parasha. I'm not going to talk about this next week, so I'll talk about this week. It talks about the rebellious child. You know, if you have a rebellious son, and he's a glutton and drunk and all this stuff, that you're supposed to take him and bring him to the elders and, and stone him to death. And I remember when my kids were small, I used to carry rocks in my pocket, just as a reminder. You know, when they started acting up, I just rattled the rocks a little bit. They get the message. I didn't have to preach a sermon. You just rattle some rocks. Kids get the message. And uh, but that's all of that doesn't take place until the victory comes. A uh, wise old preacher once said, "You can't clean a fish until you've caught it. You, until God changes the life inside, until the supernatural happens." We can't overcome those things. And you're never going to be Torah observant until you become God compliant. Until he becomes real to you. And as Messianics, we tend to preach a lot of the Torah, but we don't preach a lot of the Spirit. Amen. People sometimes think, well, it's just not Jewish to speak that way about it all the supernatural and those things, but I, I'm going to tell you the Bible is written by Jewish people and it's cover to cover supernatural. Amen. It's all about the miraculous. It's all about God's interaction in humanity to bring about supernatural events. It's talking about supernatural healing and I still believe fully in supernatural healing. You know why I believe in supernatural healing? Because I've seen too much of it not to. Right. I've seen people... Uh, Jim uh, 
street brought one day, it scared the life, and I, I can talk about it now because it's old news, but Jim came up to me and he said, Rabbi, I have a friend, and uh, I she's got real bad back problems, and I told her that if you prayed for her, she'd get healed. And she's driving down from Birmingham so you can pray for her. No pressure. <laughs> Don't make Jim look bad. You know, what about me? <laughs> you know, oh, Jim got his friend down here all the way, and we prayed for her, and it wasn't, you know, we didn't spend hours and hours with all kinds of fancy words and tried to say all the bequeathists and beseechuses and all those words. We just prayed a simple prayer, and she got up, and she walked across the room, and she bent down to her purse and got in her purse to get her note from her doctor. To show me what the doctor had said, and she, as she bent down to her purse, she realized she had not bent down like that in three years. She wasn't able to. And that weekend, she went dancing with her husband on heels. I can't say the heels were a great idea, but I'm impressed that she could do it. More impressed that God works in the supernatural. Amen. It wasn't about me praying for her. It was about prayer, responding to God's word, and belief that it's not about the human, it's about the supernatural. It's about what God does. I've seen financial miracles, I've seen physical miracles, I've seen restorations of marriages, and restorations of homes. I've seen too much supernatural not to believe in the supernatural, and everything I read in the Bible is about the supernatural. And yet, many times, we are too busy trying to do it in the flesh to take a minute to pray. I don't know how many times I've seen believers say, I've got a headache, I'm going to go get an aspirin. And I'm not preaching against aspirin, although I don't take aspirin. Uh, I would if I ever got that bad and my faith didn't work. But, I mean, when I had appendicitis, I went to a doctor. They cut my appendix out. It isn't that I don't believe in doctors or I don't believe in medicine. It's that I believe first you go to God. Right. And that we should do that. We should. But when we, when we go first to the medicine cabinet, we're going to human right. for answer. Now, that doesn't mean human can't answer needs. My wife cooks for me every day. I don't wake up in the morning and wait for man to fall. I'm not against human interaction to solve physical needs. We all eat. We all drink. So I'm not preaching against doing the human side. I'm preaching against doing the human side because of the supernatural. Not as opposed to it or only after the human side doesn't work. You know, we, we try first doing it ourselves and then we go to our friends and then we go to their friends and... Then we go to our family, and then finally we go to God. Seek ye first. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. In every area of your life, if you're struggling this morning with some kind of attack of the enemy against you, first you have to know that the enemy was defeated 2,000 years ago. Amen. The victory was already yours. It was already promised to you. You just have to go to the Lord and accept what he's promised you. And walk in that promise. Whatever it is. Whatever you're struggling with. And the truth is. If we're honest. Most of all of us are struggling with something. Other than my wife who's perfect in every way. The rest of us struggle. And. Uh, struggling. Isn't sin. Struggling and not going to God. Can be. We need to realize that. We get beaten up way too often because we fight a fight that's not ours. And a fight we can't win on our own. And a fight that we don't have to fight because it's already been won. Everything in this week's partial. Everything in next week's partial is all based upon the promise that God gave of victory.
we win the battles. Next week it says we win the land. We win. It's already ours. It's already done. It's already established. There's nothing you can do to change the truth that the body of Messiah, the children of Israel, the people of God are winning, have won, will continue to win, and ultimately will enter into the fullness of God's promises in the future, in the world to come. Nothing you do, nothing you say will ever change that. The only thing that will change is your participation in that victory. It's all a matter of how you want to spend the rest of your life. If you want to spend the rest of your life struggling and fighting on your own, you can do that. That's not really my goal. I don't like pain, suffering. I don't even eat hot, spicy food. I just don't like pain. I, I, people eat the spice. My son eats habaneros and, and jalapenos and ghost peppers and all that stuff. I'm like, why do you want to hurt yourself? Where is the where's the joy in that? I just I chocolate is like as strong as I go. <laughs> you know, and just not not going. I don't like suffering. I don't like pain. I don't like none of those things. I, I just don't. I, I don't like to inflict on myself, and, and I don't want to live my life spiritually inflicting pain on myself that I don't have to. I like much better when I'm walking in victory because I started my day praying, I continued my day praying. And I end my day praying. Praying without ceasing was not a joke. It isn't an unreachable thing. It's what God wants and desires from us so that every circumstance in our life, we understand the power of God so that we can understand and apply the Word of God. And if you walk outside the power of God, you cannot understand the Word of God. That's why Romans says the carnal man is at, mind is at enmity to God and cannot understand the word of God. That's what was happening with the Sadducees. You almost have to say it because they were sad, you see. <laughs> they were trying to understand the word of God without the power of God. The reason this is so important to say this morning is because I don't ever want the Messianic movement, I don't ever want our congregation to get so entrenched in the letter of the law that we forget the spirit of the law. That we forget that the reason we have the Torah is because the power of God spoke it into existence. And it's that power that gives us the ability to be witnesses, to walk in his ways, to do what he says. All the rest of it is easy once you decide you want to. And the reason we decide we want to is because we've experienced the fellowship of God's Spirit in our lives. And it changes everything. Amen. We can argue about what that looks like. Exactly when somebody gets filled with God's Spirit and all the qualifications and all those things. But I kind of think that our experience with the Holy Spirit is just like our experience with everything else, and it's just a little different. Uh, I don't think that everybody has to receive the Spirit of God in the same way that I did, or walk in exactly the same way that I walk. I think God has liberty within his Torah that we can all be individuals. Otherwise, we'd all look the same, and wouldn't that be frightening? <laughs> I do think that there has to be an experience. And if we're preaching Torah without experience, we're failing. If we're teaching a line to God's word on your own ability, your own power, your own, it's not going to be there. If we're trying to teach conviction without the power of God, we're going to only have condemnation. We're going to have a lot of people that are depressed all the time because they're failing instead of walking in victory because they've succeeded. We're going to have a lot of more broken families, broken homes, a lot more alcoholics and drug addicts, a lot more things falling apart within the body. 
because we're not walking in the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. I know this is a simple message. I hope that you didn't come looking for any kind of fancy thing because I'm just too tired to give it to you. I spent seven days, five days resting. Now, it would have been easier to work. Anybody ever tried resting? I want you to sit there and do nothing. I just, it's very difficult for me. I, it's very stressful. So I'm, I'm glad I'm home so I can relax by going back to doing things. It's very hard. I don't know. Pammy's like, how long do you sleep in the morning? I don't know, six. I'll, I'll sleep in all the way to 6.15 if I can. But by then I'm like, what can I do? What can I do? And uh, but I'm working on it. What? Is, is time? Is, are you telling me I'm out of time? Now i got to go an extra 10 minutes because I am not going to listen to Jerry. <laughs> That's okay. This is my favorite sermon. You get the kids, yes. Look, it's just so important for us to understand. This whole chapter on the Sadducees is there to tell us we can't do it on our own. And I'm just telling you this morning that if you're trying to do it on your own, you're going to fail every time. And it's just going to get frustrating to yourself. It's going to get frustrating to your family. It's going to get frustrated on the job. It's going to get frustrated everywhere and in every individual. But it doesn't have to be. And the whole good news is that it doesn't have to be. The whole good news is that Yeshua came, gave his life, was buried, resurrected in the power of the resurrection, and then sent the Ruach so that we could be overcomers. That's the good news. The good news is you don't have to do it on your own. The good news is God doesn't want you to do it on your own. The good news is that we've already had the victory. It's already been promised. It's not an if, it's a when. And the when is up to you. When you fight a battle and win, when you enter the land. It's all up to you. And I just want to encourage you this morning to turn to the Lord and let Him lead you, guide you, strengthen you, give you the power to overcome. Because He will. And He wants to. It's just a matter of giving it to Him. Life is so much easier when you let the one that controls everything be in control. And you stop deceiving yourself into thinking that you have any control. Because you don't. It's all his. Every bit of it. Let's all stand.